Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. The ninth annual Victoria Independent Film and Video Festival will be held February 7th through February 16th. Last year, over 11,000 people attended the festival. This year, 700 films were considered in assembling the program of over 40 feature films and over 100 shorts. In reaction to what many perceive to be a homogeneity among Hollywood films, independent film festivals have been growing in locations all over the world. Festival director Kathy Kay explains the importance of having festivals such as Victoria's. I think it's important because it, it offers different viewpoints and cultural outlooks and I think as you know cinema becomes more homogenized that it's it's really important that we hear from other people and other places. Part of it's cultural diversity, but part of it is just um, different viewpoints even within the same culture. We took some time this week to think about film as cultural production. We were especially intrigued about how digital technology is making filmmaking more accessible and blurring the boundary between high and low culture. Every part of the filmmaking process from inception to distribution seems to be affected by new technologies. Creation of films and videos is less expensive and less challenging because of the technology. Differences in distribution seem cosmetic nowadays. Video cassettes explore the space between the two media, with titles that seem to draw upon film paradigms, titles that seem to draw upon television paradigms, and titles that are a departure from either tradition. The existence of commercial announcements does not suffice to explain the distinction. Cable television channels exist that show no commercials at all. Stations that show commercials sometimes show less than the CRTC limit of 12 minutes per hour would permit. Simultaneously, Films shown in theaters are always prefaced by previews for other movies and sometimes prefaced by advertisements for other products, especially those on hand at the theater's concession stands, never mind the product shots in the films themselves. As a practical matter, pieces nominally produced for cinema distribution are often intended by their makers for release to video before the majority of the population of North America has had a chance to see them on the big screen. Are such efforts best described as mostly theater or as mostly video? This is not to say that challenges can no longer be found for filmmakers. Money is still part of the equation, and money for the arts is tighter than it was 40 years ago in both the U.S. and Canada. Making socially relevant films, experimental films, and controversial films remains a struggle. But social supports do exist to aid filmmakers in producing and distributing films outside of the Hollywood oligopoly. We spoke with two of the filmmakers who will be debuting their films this week at the festival. Sherry LePage and Tony Snowsill both reside in Victoria. LePage's From Baghdad to Peace Country and Snowsill's Criminal Acts are both funded by the National Film Board of Canada. We spoke with them about the challenges of making controversial and socially relevant documentaries, how support from the film board helped them, and what it is like to have world premieres of their films in their hometown. We also spoke with Diane Searle, the executive director of MediaNet, one of at least two film and video collectives in Victoria, which offer filmmakers a chance to learn more about filmmaking, create films and videos, and network with others in the industry. Searle discusses with us the democratization of filmmaking and the effects advances in new technologies are having on the industry. Don't touch that dial and stay tuned for an episode about filmmaking we call Talking Pictures.
First of all, I'd like to welcome you again to the CFUV studios. I'd like you to tell us your name, the name of your film, and when it's going to be shown. My name's Sherry LePage. Uh, the film that I've done is called From Baghdad to Peace Country, and it's having its world premiere during the Victoria Festival at uh, Legends at 7 o'clock on Monday the 10th. Who did you have in mind for the audience for this film? What kind of people would you like to see it? Well, if there's a, a specific audience, um, what I'm hoping it will do is reach people who are not necessarily really politically aware and involved in the issue of sanctions up until now. People who maybe wouldn't necessarily go to a political rally or, or, or things like that. And um, because I think this film is more inclined to reach people in an emotional way than uh, than in a political way. Your film was made in cooperation with the National Film Board, is that right? Uh, yes, the National Film Board uh, produced it, so essentially it funded it and is will distribute it. How has working with the National Film Board limited or enhanced your efforts to connect with the audience you have in mind? Well, it's completely enhanced it because the Film Board, with its resources, has a reach that's far greater than anything that I could do myself as an independent filmmaker. Uh, they distribute films um, not only across Canada but internationally. And so they're trying to get it broadcast in America, for instance, uh, as well as across Canada and putting it in festivals all over the world. So yeah, there's, there's no way that I could do that on my own. Are they looking at film festivals only or do they look at television showings as well, cable they, channels, that sort of thing? They look at everything and will sell or lend to community groups that want to have nonprofit showings to uh, educate people about the issues. What particular advantages or disadvantages does showing your film in a festival in your hometown hold? You're from Victoria originally, is that right? Yes, I live here. Well, it's really great to be having your world premiere in your hometown. I think it helps all of us who work here in film to uh, be able to let people know that there's a, a really quite a large and active Indigenous community of uh, documentary filmmakers here, and uh, not everyone knows that. When you think about the film industry, uh, most people will think of feature films coming in from elsewhere to shoot here. Actually, there's there are quite a lot of projects and filmmakers that are happening right here all the time. Could we hear a little bit more about those and how that uh, helps you out personally? Well, there are quite a lot of documentary filmmakers who uh, who do social issue documentaries. I mean, a few I can name are Asterisk Productions that uh, did a film called Juan Carlos uh, and uh, Reinventing the World, a, a series. I mean, May Street um works out of here. They've just done uh, a film on uh, slavery that has been on PBS. Across Borders has done a number of things, the latest being a New Age to New Edge about the about uh, environmentalists and the personal growth mo movement and uh, how people are learning how to change their approach to some of the conflicts that are inherent in that by working on themselves. And uh, how that helps me. Well, it's it's really useful to be part of a network. Most of what I've learned about making documentaries I've picked up on the fly from other filmmakers who are more experienced than I am. Uh, even though I took a, a broadcast course in my youth, um, mostly I worked in news and I've never actually gone to film school. So it's kind of, you know, an informal mentoring, which is wonderful. A lot of advice, a lot of uh, generous people who will give you their time and lend you their gear and so for somebody who's who's starting out and doesn't necessarily have the resources to uh, to be able to do everything themselves, it's absolutely invaluable. So you got more than a little bit of help along the way. Oh, I did. I got an, I got an enormous amount of help um, on this project. Before the uh, NFB came on board, I was trying to figure out how I could get it funded myself, which in the Canadian broadcast climate is really difficult to do, uh, to, to get funding for social issue documentaries, especially something that's potentially dicey as, you know, the Canadian government's policies on things like sanctions in Iraq. So, I mean, I had no money to be able to pay a crew to be able to do things, but the story was developing and events were happening. And so, you know, people like Bill Weaver were willing to come out and, uh, and do some shooting for me just on spec and not knowing whether they would ever get paid or if it would ever turn into a project. That must have been convenient. Well, it was more than convenient. It was a lifesaver because some of the uh, events in the film were never going to happen again. I mean, this particular one was Derek Houston's mother and child art piece in Saanich that was being done. And if I couldn't have covered it, it would not have been filmed. What do you see as being the future of this film after it's shown at the film festival? Well, I hope it'll have a long future. Um, it's been invited to a couple of festivals so far. Uh, there's one in Powell River that's a young festival, and I'm going to be taking it up there uh, next week to show it to high school students. 
It's been invited to the uh, Festival des Films sur l'Art in Montreal, which is a really prestigious festival that I'm, I feel quite honored to be part of. It's being submitted to the Amnesty International Festival in Amsterdam and a festival in Prague and a number of other ones that I, I haven't heard about yet. But, you know, it is an ongoing kind of thing. And I hope that some broadcasters will be running it. And we'd like to see it on air before the war uh, happens, of course, but I have very little control over that. Tell us a little more about the content of the film. I'd like to hear more details about that. Well, the the film is about Derek Houston, who is an artist who lives here in Victoria. He's uh, primarily a landscape painter, and um, while he's not a household word like Robert Bateman, he's certainly collected both in Canada and internationally. Um, he went to Iraq in 1999 as part of a peace group that was going to see firsthand how the uh, sanctions against Iraq were affecting civilians, especially children. And he was, like everyone else on that trip, absolutely horrified with the the state of things there, especially children dying of cancer with no painkillers and the lack of food and the destruction of the whole educational system and the infrastructure and everything. So when he came back from Iraq, he had a real need to speak up about it. He's always had an interest in social justice. After a while, he finally figured out that he could get more interest in what he was saying about Iraq by doing something that was a lot more kind of imaginative than just trying to talk to people. And so he launched um, a mother and child art project in which he's making these huge and really beautiful outlines of a mother and child in natural materials in different parts of the world. It was hay in Saanich, it was wildflowers and grasses in Scotland, and he's been um, building a peace sanctuary out of stone in northeastern BC. Uh, there's a little town called Hudson's Hope, which is uh, really beautiful, and that's the, the main part of what we filmed. The film is about both his process as an activist and as an artist and turning the anger that he felt at the situation into something positive and a way to reach people in, in ways that you know maybe you don't in other, in other kinds of media. You seem as a small producer in this field, so to speak, to be somewhat at the mercy of, well, financing. Of course, I'm sure that's true of everybody in this field, but I would guess that the uh, small boats fuel the currents more strongly than the ocean liners. Oh, you're absolutely right there. Um, funding is increasingly a nightmare for documentary filmmakers. Had it not been for the NFB, I don't know whether this project would have been done. It took two and a half years to un for the story to unfold, and broadcasters aren't necessarily willing to wait that long. I mean, what you have to do is get broadcast licenses, and when you have a certain percentage of your budget in broadcast licenses, then you start applying for funds from, from all kinds of different government-related funds, and there are far, far more people applying for money than they have money to support. Well, that's always the case, I'm afraid. Well, it's like, it's like any other kind of art, certainly. You talked briefly about the uh, context in which these uh, these films get made. You mentioned that your background was in news or media. I can't remember which term you used. How is this a departure from that? How is your new career different from your old career? You can be as specific or as vague as you like <laughs> on this one. I realize it's <laughs> yeah, somewhat a, personal. That's a big question. Um, well, I spent 14 years working for CBC Television News in Edmonton and Vancouver. Since I moved to Victoria, I've been uh, working as a freelancer doing um, education, medical education videos, and then working on other people's documentaries. And I guess I would have to say the main difference between doing the, the broadcast news and doing documentary is the amount of depth that you're able to go into in documentary. I, in news, you have to try and get to the nub of the story in a couple of minutes. And there are lots and lots of nuances and lots of detail and lots of thoughtful analysis that you never have time for or room for. And the thing that I love about documentary is that I'm able to look into something for months on end and really think about it and talk to other people about it and try and find some different way of expressing the story than might immediately come to mind when you've got to pump something out every day. I've heard TV journalism indicted for its lack of depth because of the time considerations. One person in particular who's working for a TV station in town, which will remain nameless, was lamenting to me about having gone to journalism school for X years, only to get out and be told your job is to tell an in-depth story in 90 seconds. She was somewhat nonplussed by that. Well, I can imagine. Um, I mean, I guess maybe not every story 
needs that much in depth, but you, you, you know, there's certainly no time to really do any serious thinking about what you're doing when you have to come up with something every single day. But, but then there are also current affairs shows and documentary shows where you do get to see viewpoints that are a bit more complex gone into. Thank goodness so far we still have that in Canadian television. So it's a broader palette. I would say so. I mean, it, certainly the CBC's got a number of documentary strands like The Passionate Eye, for instance, uh, Witness. Um, I know v Vision used to ha run a lot more documentaries than it does. That was the place where we all used to go for broadcast licenses because Vision did have a, a really good reputation for, for using documentaries that are about ethical issues quite broadly. And now they're, they're a bit more uh, narrowly focused on faith and religion than they were. So, you know, sometimes you can still do things there, but it, it's not as open as it was. You're speaking of the cable TV channel. Yeah, Vision. Uh, channel. Uh, I think it's 52 now. Well, that's most of what I needed to know. If there's uh, something else you'd like to add at this point, maybe mention some of the people who helped you out on the crew for this project. Oh, the absolutely. The key grip, the gaffer, that sort of thing. <laughs> of course, I would like to uh, acknowledge and thank Derek Houston, the subject of my film, for trusting me with his story. It's a really major responsibility to reflect someone's story that way, especially someone you know personally. I was very lucky to have Mandy Leith as a, an editor. There's a saying that uh, a good editor is partly technical and partly psychic and partly creative, and Mandy is all that and more. There were a number of people who did the shooting. Doug Showquist in uh, Vancouver is a freelancer, and Bill Weaver here did some of the shooting. We were really lucky to find people who were on the peace tour with Derek in Iraq to be able to use some of their footage. And, you know, and of course, uh, Tracy Friesen, who was the producer at the National Film Board, who got this project a few days after she started work there and has been uh, really amazing in her ability to guide and make it all work out. So uh, I'm really grateful for the film board's participation. Well, thanks again for coming out today. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM, Victoria. I'd like to start by uh, getting your name for our listeners the name of your film, and when the film is going to be shown during the film festival. Well, my name's Tony Snowsill, and I am the director and writer of Criminal Act, which is a National Film Board documentary dealing with a theater program at the William Head Prison, a, a local film as far as Victoria is concerned, but one I think that is of national interest because of the implications that uh, exist for the treatment of prisoners and what they do for themselves, and I think possibly the importance of the arts, uh, in this case theater, assisting in the rehabilitation of inmates. The film is going to be shown uh, on Saturday, February the 8th, that's this coming Saturday, at 1 p.m. at the Capitol 6 as a part of the Victoria International Film Festival. So I think it's actually the first day of screenings. I'm not entirely sure of that, but I think it is. This is actually its uh, world premiere. Who did you have in mind for the audience for this film? Who did you envision seeing it? Who would you like to see it? Well, that's rather a difficult question in, in as much as to, to say an adult audience is very general. But I think that anybody who is interested at all in social issues of any kind would find this interesting. Um, and I think most particularly in light of the kind of press that has been around the Canadian Correction Service, I think that they get a bad rap very often. I mean, there are people who believe that William Head, for argument's sake, is a real soft touch for the people who are living there. While it's certainly better than most prisons, it's still a prison, and one's life in a place like that is constrained. You mentioned that you thought that the film had national relevance. Yes, it does, because there's, uh, there are implications in here for the role of the arts, I would say, and most, most particularly the role of theater in rehabilitation, the kinds of things that uh, spring from their, the inmates' involvement in, in the theater society at William Head is that they develop communication skills that they might otherwise not have an opportunity to develop to the same degree. 
I think also the, the fact that they are really forced to cooperate in an environment where cooperation is, a, is generally at a minimum because people are protecting themselves. And most importantly, I think, is that once they get on stage, they have to lower their guard and lower the barriers and let people see them. And by see them, I mean they are open and vulnerable in that context because they're, they're dealing with emotional issues very often on stage. And that's a very difficult thing to do in prison because it does make you vulnerable. I mean, it gives other people the opportunity to perhaps take advantage of a misinterpretation of those emotions that you're showing. You made your film in cooperation with the National Film Board, is that right? Well, the National Film Board produced it, uh, and I directed and, and, and wrote it. Okay. How is working with the Film Board limited or enhanced your efforts to connect with the audience you have in mind? It's a great benefit to be working with the Film Board. First of all, the mere fact of uh, financing documentary productions is very important in and of itself. And then having being relieved of the producing responsibilities and having somebody take those things on leaves one free to to work as a director and writer. Uh, so, and we had a very good producer in Tracy Friesen. It's just a very good working relationship. The other thing too is that the film board has the means of disseminating it uh, very very widely and also publicizing it in uh, uh, in ways that I probably would be unable to do myself. You're from Victoria. What particular advantages or disadvantages does showing your film in a festival in your hometown hold? I wouldn't say that there are any disadvantages. I think that uh, uh, I think there's a great advantage to, to for the film industry in general here in Victoria. Uh, it's not very big, obviously, because this is a small this is a fairly small town. But there are more and more people uh, moving and working here. I think largely because of um, it's such a hell of a nice place to live with the kind of technologies that are available now. Uh, being off the beaten track a little bit isn't too much of a problem. Uh, one goes over to Vancouver for some of the post-production and so forth, and you know it's rather a nice break. But uh, I, I don't see that there's really any um, disadvantage to, to being in, in Victoria, nor is there a disadvantage to showing it in, in, a, in a film festival here. In fact, I'm rather glad that it is being shown here first, because it's, uh, it, I think it's pretty nice to have have a locally produced film, a locally uh, made film, being uh, premiered in, in one's hometown. Do you get over to Vancouver much? For business reasons, I mean. It's only in as much as film work takes us over there. There are obviously occasions when one needs to go over there, but and that would be dealing with uh, or going to the film board or some of the other agencies that are in, in, in Vancouver. Uh, also, most of the post-production facilities are over there that we would use. It sounds like you think Victoria is, quote, off the beaten track, close quote, to use your words, only somewhat, and that it is in a good way. Is that generally the impression you've gotten from working here in the uh, film industry specifically? Yeah, I mean, when I say that it's off the beaten track, I, what I mean by that is that the, the for English Canada, the two major filmmaking centers are Toronto and Vancouver. A lot of the people that one would deal with are in Vancouver or Toronto. Uh, so you're away from that on a face-to-face -face basis. So, I mean, it's off the beaten track in that sense. But being away from, I suppose, the center of things isn't, isn't much of a problem these days, as I said, because of the, the technologies that are available. Are you comfortable with most of the new technologies? My understanding, for example, is that film editing is done largely on computer nowadays and that 10 years ago that would have been unthinkable given the state of the technology at the time yeah well well, well i think that there's an there was an evolution here when uh, i mean t videotape itself has been around for a long time but the technology to to make it as totally portable uh, as it is you know for recording purposes but then also to be able to use it in post is 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 a relatively new phenomenon but the the principles are fundamentally the same, whether one is editing film on a bench or on with a computer. The one still has to, has to structure, one has to consider how the film is going to be put together, how it's going to be structured. The editor still has the same problems to deal with, uh, the same solutions to find. It's just that the technology is different. One is, one is chemical, one's electronic. But creatively, it's essentially the same, although there are numbers of things that you can do very simply in uh, contemporary technology, electronic technology that were far more cumbersome with film. So the difference is one that strikes you as relatively insignificant? 
Yeah, from a creative point of view, there isn't really much difference. It's just the mechanics are different. The end result is essentially the same. It's just that some of the processes are different, and it's just a matter of then understanding what those processes are in order to be able to use them as uh, as best as one can. How did you come to filmmaking? Is it something that you've done since childhood, or did you have uh, a career <laughs> before this one, as it were? No, a, no, no. I, I came... A previous life, or I whatever came, you'd like to call it. Yeah, no, I came at it through uh, television very, very early on. When I first arri- arrived in Canada, I'd been in, I'm from Australia, and I'd spent a couple of years in Europe, and then uh, when I came here, it was quite a long time ago, uh, in the 50s, uh, television well, it wasn't all that old then, it was quite young, and I started working in the CBC. I just kept on going, I guess, with the way I put it. So it was just through starting in television when television was young. Television was young and I was young. And it just snowballed from there? Yeah, I mean, I stayed in the business and kept on, I uh, just kept on working. I eventually went out on my own and uh, made films independently. What do you see as the future of this film? Do you have any showings planned for it after this? Have you thought about television distribution at all? Well, the film board looks after that, and they have it in front of some broadcasters now, and I'm sure that it will go to uh, probably go to other festivals as well. I, I would see it certainly being broadcast. I don't think there'll be uh, much question of that. And I think it might have, this possibly might have resonance in the United States because what we see in this film is so totally different from the kinds of, of things that I think one would expect to see in a prison in the United States. I don't think you, you'd see anything like this because there's a very different, very different philosophy, I think, towards uh, incarceration that exists up here. But I do, I think that, that, um, one of the things that about the theater company itself, I think one would need an environment very similar to William Head, and by that I mean one where everybody's not locked down in separate little cells every night. As you probably know, they're housed at William Head in kind of condominium-style residences with half a dozen people to a house, and that fosters some cooperation to begin with. They They have the freedom to move around 80 acres of ground when they're not either performing the duties that they have to while they're, while they're there or taking programs or whatever else is required of them. And so I think that the environment, the physical environment of William Head is conducive to perhaps more than another environment to the development of the theater company. And it's been going for 21 years, so I think that's a testament to it. The reason that it's been able to go on, as far as I can make out, is that it's always maintained by the people who have uh, long-term sentences or the lifers, that they provide a kind of continuity, that they, they may go away from it for a year or two, but then they come back. And there are people who are a member of that theater company now that I have been there since and been, been actively promoting it in William Head in the time that I've been going out there for, which is now over, well over three years. If you'd like to put in a plug for some of the other films you've done, now will be the time for that. I spent a lot of time in uh, working in the Aboriginal community, and uh, I made, I made, made, I've made a number of films around those kind, around those issues. Uh, one on Aboriginal child welfare, another one on, um, which was called uh, Our Children Are Our Future, and another one called To Walk with Dignity, which was way ahead of its time because I made that some years ago and it was about uh, Aboriginal self-government. I don't think too many people understood what we were talking about when I made that. Well, I thank you for the time and, and, and the interest. Sure, sure. So, Thanks a lot for agreeing to uh, oh, speak no, that's, with me today. No, that's my pleasure. That's my pleasure. To start off, I'd like to know more about what you do for MediaNet, the sorts of things that you find yourself doing on a day-to-day basis. Well, I'm executive director of MediaNet, and I have been for about three and a half years. Um, And it's changed a lot over that time because we've grown a lot during that time. So at the beginning, I did everything from, you know, booking equipment to putting equipment out to it was actually running out of my house for a period of time. Now we have another staff person, so a lot of my time is spent raising money to keep the organization going, to get the funding for the equipment, to get the funding to cover expenses for staff and office space. On a day-to-day basis, a fair amount of my time is spent on the phone with other people, um, trying to set up things like programming, that uh, we want to bring in someone for a workshop or something like that speaking with members about what they would like to see happen and doing the finances. Uh, That's a fairly big chunk of time. And then working with the board and with the staff person to make sure that things like the equipment rental are working properly and we've got the policies that we need to have to make it all work and that things are evolving in the right direction. (laughs) That's most of it. Does MediaNet have an actual mandate? Yes, we do. 
We have a five-part mandate. I won't go into the whole thing. It's a bit long. The main part of our mandate is to assist film and video makers in making their work. And that's done primarily by uh, providing equipment at extremely low cost for people. So a filmmaker, a video maker can walk out of Medianet with, you know, thirty or forty or fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment. Obviously that would be very hard for them to either buy impossible or to rent at commercial rates. I want to clarify, they are expected to walk back with it at some point. They are that. expected to walk back with it. And actually it's been really interesting. We have had no troubles at all in four years. We have had you know, no, we've had basically no broken equipment, no lost equipment. So it's very much an honor system. I mean, people are obviously were insured and they're liable, but it, we've been incredibly lucky. It, that part has gone really well. So basically it's about access. So anyone who wants to make a video for whatever you know, kind of moral purpose, ethical purpose, can, can, do, can do that. You know, someone decides that they want to cover the Peace March. Our cameras have been at you know, basically every Peace March. If someone wants to be making a short dramatic production, they can take out the equipment and they'll have the lights, the sound, the camera, the editing gear. They'll have everything that they need. So basically it, it means that anyone can be making video regardless of their level of the economic means, and that's really the central part of our mandate. Second to that would be assisting those people in terms of, of learning the skills. It's an incredibly complex medium to learn. You know, there's just so many parts to it, from the sound to the light to the, the aesthetic parts of it. So we help people with that through workshops, through setting up a community where people are learning from each other, giving each other feedback on their work, and they're also crewing on each other's shoots. Then we also have workshops so that uh, we bring in people with more expertise to assist people as well. And then it's also really important when you're making film or video to see other work that's good. So we bring in as much as we can in terms of screenings as well so people can see that. And we also have a more public space as well, and that's been kind of slower up and running. But we've done some collaborative screenings with Cine Center, for instance, and we'll be doing a few film festivals in about a year's time. Um, Best of the festivals, bringing work from all across the country so people can see it. And uh, Edges, which is a regional film festival, so we'll be showing the best of work from Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands in, in a festival specifically geared to uh, to showing local work and that will have a, a broader appeal so that more people in the area can get a, a taste of what's going on in independent film uh, both locally and across the country and then we also have a ed- public education mandate uh, in terms of what what kind of issues are happening in film and video and how can we assist with getting understanding about those issues out in the community so that some of the things that uh, need to be changed can change. In what ways do you think the newer technologies are changing the production of media? They're changing it a lot. The main thing they're doing is they're, de- de- they're democratizing the medium, um, which I think is a very good thing. Uh, it means that anyone basically with very little financial resources can now come and find a way to join Medianet or Cinebic and have equipment for little or no cost. They can pay for their tapes and they can make something. Now, they won't be necessarily paying their crew if they're doing that um, without any kind of funding, but they can. things can be made for, for very little cost, and that wasn't the way that it was at all when it was just film as an option. So what it means is work can be made without having to go through the, the fairly strict, and in terms of drama, say, uh, you know, write a script, get funding for, for a script from you know, the certain places that fund scripts, and then go out and get funding for the shoot and, you know, carry on kind of step by step, but needing funding agencies because you just can't make enough money to, uh, you know, to make the film yourself any other way. And that has now changed so that someone can make a film fairly inexpensively. It can also be a more experimentally oriented film because you can do things with video that you can't do uh, very easily in, in, in film in a lot of ways, and certainly it's not for low cost. You can go and get funding after the fact, so you might have a, a way of working that doesn't sell well on paper, but would be incredible visually, and you would have an opportunity to actually make that film and try and, and try and have it funded after the fact, and then transfer it to film for theatrical release, or possibly not, just uh, just put it out there in a you know DVD format. So uh, the expense is changing what is being made. A much more organic process is possible because many people can own or have frequent access to their own equipment in in video. Then you can make a piece over a longer period of time instead of the traditional like 28 day shoot and then you go into an edit. You can decide to make a, a feature. There was one at the Victoria Film Festival uh, a few years ago that was a very interesting piece that was made over three years every every second weekend with a digital camera. That's not the kind of thing you're going to be doing if you're usually if you're working in film. It, it can happen, but it's, it would be much more rare. Um, the look of film and video are, are different, and individual artists really have to figure out how to make whichever one they're going to use work. For them, still, the film look is, is preferable for most people, for most 
for most purposes. Um, certainly when it's going to be projected, that's still the case. That's less true when uh, people are just looking at a TV release on something. So for the documentary makers, it hasn't really been a problem at all. I think it's been almost complete gain in terms of documentaries. Almost all of them are now made digital video. Video cameras are, are much less obtrusive, and no one doesn't notice you when you're walking around with a film camera. So things like guerrilla filmmaking, if you're in a different country or someplace here where you would be pretty obtrusive and perhaps not even allowed with a film camera or even a larger video camera, you can have a small video camera and blend right in. So it means there's, there's places you can get to, there's events you can cover. And that's important both from what is covered in terms of the material that you can bring away. It's also very important in terms of the presence that is there in terms of it's kind of a witness, so it also has a political purpose as well that uh, wouldn't be happening if people didn't have access to those kinds of uh, things. At, at the WTO conference, for instance, there was a lot of footage that came out of there that told a lot of people what it was really like there. Excuse me, do you yeah. mean the Seattle conference? Yes, yeah, okay. that's the Seattle conference. Yeah, there was a lot of video footage that came out of there. And I think that that will have an impact in terms of people knowing they're being watched, or at least I certainly hope so <laughs> anyway. Um, also, it's more intimate. Video is more intimate. When you've got someone who's being filmed for something, you know, may have mixed feelings about that, it's, it's probably somewhat easier for some people to speak um, in front of a video camera than if you have the whole shebang there. And just even the size makes a difference. You know, you can travel with a, a video camera and, and have one ac at your access all the time. So you can be collecting images over time. So for people who are working experimentally or in documentary fashion where there's a lot of gathering of things that you may not know you're going to run into, that's also a real plus. Projection is still problematic in terms of um, video. It's getting better, but projection is problematic. So that's, I think that's one of the, the bigger hurdles that video has to overcome. And the technology is getting so much better fast that I think that will, you know, that, that is happening. But it, at this point, it's, it's uneven at best. Sometimes you see a, a projected theatrical release, and it's, it's, it's fabulous. You can't believe it's video. And sometimes you see it, and it's, it's not good. So that's still a problem. But it's still possible to shoot something on video and then get it transferred to film afterwards. So that's, you know, that's an option people can, uh, can go with. Um, distribution, it's changing the face of distribution a lot. It's very expensive to ship around film prints from all over the country at, at the same time. To have a theatrical release for anything is very expensive. Um, Hollywood does fine with that because they have so much money to pump into advertising. They know that at least a reasonable amount of the time they're going to fill the theaters. In Canada, it's, it, distribution is very, very problematic. Many good features don't make it to the theaters at all or have a, a one-week release in a theater here or there. Take something like Ararat, for instance, Adam McGuinn's latest film. That was in the theaters for, I don't think it was more than one or two weeks at Christmas. And um, it was an amazing film. It was absolutely an amazing film in terms of the, the, the wallop that it packed and the story that it told. Yet, if the crowds aren't coming out fast enough, uh, it just doesn't stay. With DVD or other digital means of putting work out in places, it costs nothing, basically. It costs absolutely nothing, and you can put it in an envelope and ship it. So it means that different kinds of venues can show work. Um, outside the normal system, and that's a very positive thing. And people can self-distribute their work. Uh, also, things going on to the web is something that's happening a lot, a lot now. So there's a democratization there too. Now there's still a problem of getting people to see the work. That's obviously a huge challenge, but it is physically much easier to, to distribute that video than the film. So I would say overall what video does is it, it's changing who can make film, it's changing what stories can be told, and it's changing the fact that it can be done outside uh, the system. And I think that that's, that's very good. How does one go about getting membership in MediaNet? You phone 381-4428, and um, we can take care of you that way. Or our email is info at media-net.vc.ca. Well, I have what I need. If there's anything else you'd like to add, here's your opportunity. Okay. Well, I think one of the things you mentioned was um, where does the Victoria fit in in terms of Canada into the whole picture. And I think historically we've had a very, very strong documentary community. There's been a constant stream of uh, socially relevant documentary coming out of Victoria for you know, 10, 15, 20 years uh, in kind of increasing volume over time. And uh, it's been broadcast all over the world, and it's, it's high-quality work. That's very similar to what has happened in terms of Canada on a whole. The documentary work came first, and the drama uh, has, has come later. And that's the same thing that's happening in, uh, in Victoria. The drama is happening slower than the uh, documentary, and I think that the digital is what's really making a difference here. Because there's no movie industry here, 
Uh, people haven't been able to historically make a film by getting cheap roll-ins at the at the place that they shoot or that they're working in, and they can't get guild people to to help them and pull, call back in favors and and make their first film. That hasn't been available to people in Victoria. But now that digital is happening, then people here have a lot more options to be making work. There's also a fairly decent experimental kind of strand here, and uh, a filmmaker Rick Raxon, who's shows work all over the world has been here for quite a long time and there's a little strand of people who are also putting out quite strong experimental work that's at the beginning stages but that's also i think uh, on the rise as well and i think uh, i think victoria is going to see a real increase in terms of what's happening here particularly in the drama and the experimental because the doc, doc is really already up to speed and i think there's something about being away from the center of, of vancouver and toronto that has the potential to make different kinds of work be made here, and I think that uh, I think we're going to see some interesting work coming up here. Well, thanks, Diane, for agreeing to speak with us today. You're very welcome. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the Internet, cfuv.uvig.ca Giving sociology an edge! It was interesting to me to do these interviews this week because they ended up having several themes. For instance, one theme was you can't do it by yourself. Not only did you need funding, but you also needed expertise, you needed a network, you needed people who could show up and help you film something even before you had everything in order. I mean, Sherry's story about having to cover, you know, get something filmed before she actually knew whether she could make the movie or not, and therefore finding somebody who was willing to come out and film it, not knowing whether they were going to get paid or not, was an excellent example of what I'm talking about. That's a network that she had available to her. It was an informal network that she had available to her. And it was there because she was part of a community of filmmakers. And I think it's interesting to find out that a town as small as Victoria, and Victoria is pretty small by Canadian standards. Well, I'd say it's large by Canadian standards, small by American standards. It's just under 100,000 in the city and just over 300, I think, in the metro area. It depends on how you define the metro area, but for the sake of a one significant figure number, 300,000 is best. So anyway, here we are in Victoria, not a very big city, and yet it is obvious that there is a nice network going on amongst documentary filmmakers, and that network made it possible for a film to be made. In this specific case, I'm probably for many films to be made. So that's one thing. That was one theme. I mean, and that came through with Diane Searle's interview as well, because here's MediaNet, one of two collectives that we know of, and there might be more in the Victoria area. So if you don't automatically know a bunch of filmmakers or haven't informally networked into a bunch of filmmakers, here's some organizations that are available to you to connect with filmmakers through. That is expedient. Having to do the whole thing on a bootstrap basis would just be impossible, especially if you expected your film or video to be distributed rather than being the sort of thing that you keep around the house and don't actually show to anybody except when your friends are over and they're too drunk to get away with any rapidity. <laughs> Making a film is one thing. Having somebody look at it is quite another. This is an issue we've run into making radio shows. You got your production, then you got your positioning. Yes, Exactly. And I would guess that it's a hundred times worse for film and video people. And distribution has a lot of social context to it because films that, well, social and economic, films that are made by big organizations in the major film industry that already have theaters connected to them. I mean, there are some theaters that are owned by the same companies that make movies. Their distribution problem is nothing. You know, they either have the money to do the advertising to get people out in order to get theaters willing to show their films, or they already own the theaters and they put it out in their own theaters. Yeah, we used to call that a vertical monopoly back yeah, and, before the New World Order came to pass. Yes. 
Yeah, that was the, that was a big change in multimedia or in mass media, I should say, in the 1980s in the United States. And that was that vertical monopolies were considered good. Well, not just considered good, but were allowed. I mean, it wasn't just that they were bad before they were illegal before. Well, I shouldn't speak to the statute then, but I'll speak to the culture. The rule in the 80s was oligopoly is good. The rule in the 90s was oligopoly is the only good. The rule in this decade has been, if you say anything that implies oligopoly is not the only good, we're going to get you. So that's the that's the dominant position. But what we've looked at this week with these filmmakers and talking to the executive director of one of the collectives is what the other people are doing. That the oligopoly would lead you to believe through their media campaigns that no other films are being made and that no other films are being atten- attended. You know, that there is no audience for the other films. But the truth of the matter there is that other films are being made and they're being made through other kinds of social capital than having a lot of money and having a distribution center. The differences in quote distribution close quote have become blurred since television came onto the scene. The original made for TV movie pointed to this. This was probably in the forties because I know they were giving an Emmy for it in the late forties for the best made for TV movie. And then they stopped again for about 20 years and then started giving it again. And it points to the, overlap between the two media. If you make a film that is shown in theaters and then later on television, have you made it for the theater or for television? The answer is who cares? I would say with cable television, especially with the newer channels, the distinction has become even more blurred. Yeah, I would also say with the advent of the VCR, it used to be that you had to wait like one or two years after a movie was released to actually see it on television. With the advent of the VCR, some movies are made for the theater They come out, they don't work in the theater, so they go straight to video. Some marketer somewhere decides that they're better on video. So even if they were intended for a theater audience, they end up on your television screen in one way or another. I would say that the decision on that may even be made earlier in the production cycle. It may be that the filmmakers go into the film being told by their corporate masters, uh, this one's going to the theaters for two weeks at most. After that's going to video, plan accordingly. And... Another example from semi-ancient history is the B-movie, which came to prominence in the 1950s. It's a low budget. It's going straight to the (laughs) drive-in. And it's a place for Pop to take Mom and the kids on a Friday night. Just enough stimulation to get Pop interested, but not so much that Mom and the kids are offended or shocked out of their sensibilities, whatever those might be. These B-movies were put together by people who knew full well they were going straight to the drive-ins, and everybody knew it. So this sort of resignation occurs very early in the uh, process, I would guess, for the most part, the production process. And I would guess that it's not that new a thing. It's really easy to bitch about the oligopoly. But I think that it's very interesting to see that there are ways to counter that. And these two films that we talked about this week are the kinds of films that have to think about countering that. There's no way it's going to a drive-in. There's no way that it's going to a theater. So why make a film if the distribution is not going to be available to you? And the answer is you really believe in the film. And there are other ways to distribute a film than through the major dominant ways of distributing it. And I think it's interesting at this point that the National Film Board came up twice in talking to these filmmakers. I mean, we basically look for filmmakers who were local, who were in the festival, and who were premiering new work. And what we came up with by looking at that were two filmmakers who were doing the world premiere next week. That's It turns out that both of these films were National Film Board films. I mean, we didn't go looking for National Film Board films, but it turned out that the two that were making their debut were. And I think that's very telling. Uh, both of them talked about how distribution was the thing that the film board was going to help them with the most, that the film board was, in fact, capable of pushing the film into distribution, into places that, as filmmakers, they would not have been able to do on their own. I mentioned the new cable channels earlier. I think that this is a medium by which democratization of production of media has been improved. People talk about the local cable monopolies, but in fact, the local cable monopolies have to negotiate with municipalities to be the local monopolies, and the municipalities tighten the screws reasonably hard on them. 
the local cable monopolies don't have monopoly power. Well, they do have monopoly power, but it's a state sanctioned monopoly, as it were. And And the state regulated. Yes. And the state, meaning in this case, the government of the municipality, usually is pretty cagey about what they get in return for granting the monopoly. Uh, It's not democratization at the consumption end. It still costs money for cable television. And right away, that's not going to be democratic. But in terms of production of media, having 20, 25, 100 extra channels pretty much guarantees that if you put together a reasonably good film and you've gotten some reasonably good financing or funding or simple, let's call it distribution assistance, that someone somewhere is going to show your film. Maybe it'll only be viewed by 500 people at the first airing, but someone's going to see it. It's going to be out there. And the option, I point out, the option to view it will be there for anyone who subscribes to whatever channel it winds up on. This in addition to the usual film distribution media. Yeah, but there are other distribution channels. And I think that the festival is an interesting example of that, but it's not the only example. Like Sherry mentioned that the film board would make the film available to peace groups who wanted to talk about the question of sanctions in Iraq. Sometimes that can get you more viewers than the television viewing. I mean, you have 500 people who are subscribing, but if you show a film at grassroots groups all throughout Canada, and each one of them has like 50 or 100 people attending, you can beat that that 500 mark fairly quickly. And you can beat it in a much more intimate setting in which it might even be possible for the filmmaker to be present in order to discuss the film. That has, I think, a a stronger social effect in the sense that it's not just passive viewing, but it's interactive discussion, and therefore it it sticks with the viewer longer. It's not just a film that you saw. It's something that you got engaged in, that you talked about. And I think that distribution doesn't get talked about very much in major media outlets. Possibly. There's already a market for the not-quite-a-theater, not-quite-somebody's-home video technology. They talk about it in terms of home theater systems and big-screen TVs, but these are becoming popular not just in family settings, so-called, but with the small groups you describe. It's not quite having a theater. It's not quite the technology you get at the multiplex. But at the same time, it's better than sitting at home watching on the 19-inch or 13-inch or whatever you have. And as the multiplexes start throwing in more bells and whistles, the gap is going to get greater still. And the niche in the middle, the quote, intimate setting, close quote, that you mentioned, is going to be one that's filled by more and more technological producers. You see them already in sports bars, in community centers, all sorts of places. And the hook here is very simple. Come watch this program on a better screen than you have at home. Yeah, and it was interesting when Diane was talking about the difference between film and video in part being about what was projected and what wasn't. That film projects better onto a big screen than video does. I know that uh, I took a course in 1994 that was discussing sort of the future of television and the future of film. And one of the things that was predicted then that I see beginning to happen is that as the technology for flat screen television got better, and especially high definition TV, which we're already seeing some channels broadcast strictly in high definition television, and a push is being made now to get consumers to go out and purchase high definition televisions. As that moves towards completion, if you will, from a consumer point of view, What's going to happen is you're going to see theaters opening up that have huge plasma flat screens that show digitally created films. So the movies are going to actually be digital and they will be as aesthetically pleasing as what we've seen on big screen filming with projection. And this is on purpose. In other words, the people who make these things made a goal back 10 or 15 years ago to move towards pushing high definition television so that they could indeed sort of blend the public screening of things on large 
venues on large television, you know, large digital screens, and not lose what they had with big screen projection. And that way, you don't have to worry about whether you're making a movie to be distributed in theater versus making a movie to be distributed via television. It really blurs the lines. And that's what they were hoping to do, is really blur the line. That way they have multiple distribution channels available to them. What I think is really interesting, though, is that by doing this, they've actually developed technology that's more accessible. But I think that a kind of, I don't like to use the word democratization, though that's a word that Diane used, but there is a kind of leveling of the playing field going on through these new technologies. And what's interesting is right now it's actually more expensive to be a consumer of these technologies, like a plasma television costs you an incredible amount of money. It depends on how much you want to spend. You can spend almost any amount of money you want. Five-figure prices are not uncommon for the high-end models. Yeah, and that'll get cheaper. I mean, you know how new technology does that in the marketplace. But creating the digital film has actually gotten a lot less expensive. So it's actually more accessible on the production end than it is on the consumer end. Particularly if you're smart enough not to buy all the equipment yourself if you were a producer. Which is where these collectives come in. Yes. The whole idea behind them is to make it possible for a number of people who produce this sort of thing to swap off equipment in some sort of organized manner. So I guess one of the themes I picked up then as a sociologist is that there was this kind of technology taking on a life of its own in the social world. This is something that Neil Postman talks about in his book Technopoly, where technologies get made for specific purposes, but they morph into other things. The example he gives in the book is a clock. We think of clocks as very much connected to, you know, you clock into work, you clock out of work, that it's that clocks were invented to help us schedule our time for our secular lives. Industrialism. Yes. And if that's not a word, it should be. But do you know who invented the clock? Um, I don't know who invented it. Monks. Monks invented the clock. I think it was in France. I can't remember for sure. In order to mark the points in the day when they wanted to pray. So the technology was actually intended for religious purposes. The point is, is that the technology started out being for one purpose, but it's being used for other purposes. And I see that happening with digital technology. The access that that people have now to digital cameras, to the software to create films, to create you know small works of, of film, has opened up in a way that the inventors of the technology never really envisioned it happening. You have been listening to First Person Plural, because how people get along with each other still matters. First Person Plural is a show created for community radio by Carl Wilkerson and Dr. Patty Thomas to examine social and organizational issues. Person Plural is performed, composed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson, except where noted. For more information about First Person Plural, Dr. Patty Thomas, or Carl Wilkerson, Visit our website, www.culturalconstructioncompany.com, or email us at fpp at culturalconstructioncompany.com. Mm-hmm.